an exodus at last for civilians and fighters from war-torn Aleppo. Amid initial chaos and reports of sporadic gunfire, the convoys finally begin to take thousands to a place of safety. And in the last hour, the first have arrived, far from the fighting, hoping for a fresh start. Also this lunchtime, looking for friends in Brussels, but May is told other EU leaders will discuss Brexit without her. Mum, Dad and AN Other. The authorities greenlight test tube babies with three parents to avoid deadly genetic disease. And it's a team thing. An award and thanks to the RAF hero who saved the lives of two fellow parachutists who crashed to Earth. Well, uh, quite simply, without him, I don't think I'd be here. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Alistair Stewart. Good afternoon. The rebels who are now arriving in safe havens will take their disappointment at defeat with them after four years of bloody fighting. For the civilians, there's some relief after hardship, fear and hunger. The International Red Cross is ferrying them out of Aleppo to other towns and villages, some still held by those opposed to President Assad. For non-combatant men, women and their children, it is some respite, food and perhaps medicine. For the militias opposed to the Syrian regime, it is also perhaps the safety in which to regroup and prepare to fight another day. Olivia Kinsley has the latest. This is an historic moment in Aleppo. A convoy of ambulances and buses emerging from the dust and rubble of war and to relative safety, the first many on board have felt during this four-year siege. In the bitter cold, thousands more are waiting to be rescued. Speaking from Aleppo this morning, one man told ITV News it's chaos. There is no schedule, you know, it's really random and chaos when in a soccer neighbor. People are everywhere and it's true with, with in the streets, with their bags and with their clothes. And uh, there is some queue and uh, uh, it's, you know, it's really chaos. Like people are out there waiting for their turn to go and be and enter. Uh, to the bus, to go and go and leave. As one ambulance convoy tried to leave this morning, there are reports that it was fired on by pro-government militia, wounding at least three. To leave the city, the convoys must now pick a potentially lethal path through government-held territory to Idlib, which has also been bombarded. I'm caring about my uh, little boy and my uh, my my wife to be uh, safe out of the city, they, uh, they don't deserve uh, to be, to be uh, hurt. The evacuation is expected to take three days. That's if the fragile truce can hold. These people's immediate future may be in a different city, but surrounded by the same cruel war. Olivia Kinsley, ITV News. And our correspondent, Dan Rivers, is live in Aleppo. We can speak to him now. Dan, what is the latest on that evacuation? Well, we've just watched those sort of breathtaking scenes uh, unfold this afternoon in Aleppo as that convoy of 19 buses that made its way into the ravaged enclave that the rebels were still holed up in uh, and then emerged about two and a half hours later uh, filled with, we understand, about 1,000 uh, fighters and civilians and about 250 wounded uh, people uh, making their way uh, a few miles out of the city, not that far, but uh, to rebel-held territory outside the city. Uh, it was watched by hundreds of people in the area we were uh, who started cheering and waving flags of, uh, of the Syrian government as it became clear this operation had been a success. But this will be a bitter blow for the rebels. It means that finally the battle for Aleppo is over after four years of fierce fighting which have seen thousands of people killed. Dan Rivers live in Aleppo. Thank you. Theresa May has refused to comment on whether it will take 10 years to complete a Brexit deal as the UK's ambassador to the EU has suggested in a leaked memo to ministers. But an EU cold shoulder was very clear today. The Prime Minister in Brussels for a summit with other European leaders won't be attending a dinner with the other heads of state this evening. But Mrs May insists she welcomes the fact that they'll meet without her to discuss Brexit.
Well, our political correspondent, Carl Dinnan, is live in Brussels for us this lunchtime. Uh, Carl, this is the moment where it really becomes crystal clear we're on the outskirts of their talks about Brexit. Yes, very much so, Alastair, and uh, that was vividly illustrated today uh, uh, by a moment at the beginning of the uh, major European Council meeting when Theresa May cut a very awkward figure as the other leaders milled around chatting. She seemed to be on her own. She looked a bit like somebody who turned up at a party and didn't know anyone. Now, of course, Mrs May does know people here, and by the time of that meeting, she'd already had three other bilaterals with European leaders to discuss the way ahead. But it does illustrate the truth that from now on it will be one against 27. And tonight in this building, the 27 will have dinner to talk about us and we won't be there. Although Mrs May said she welcomed the fact that they were doing it. I welcome the fact that the other leaders will be meeting to discuss Brexit tonight uh, as we are going to invoke Article 50, trigger the negotiations by the end of March next year. It's right that the other leaders prepare for those negotiations as we have been preparing. We will be leaving the EU. We want that to be as smooth and an orderly process as possible. It's not just in our interest, it's in the interest of the rest of Europe as well. Thank Could you. Then and that will be the future for British leaders coming here to Brussels. They will, for a large part of it, be out on their own. Whether that takes less than two years, as some British ministers hope it will, or whether it takes up to ten years, as Britain's EU ambassador has told the government all the rest of Europe thinks it could. Carl, thank you. Here, the government's confirmed plans to boost social care services by allowing councils across England to increase council tax. The Community Secretary, Sajiv Javid, today said an extra £900 million would be available to local authorities to help fund social care services over the next two years. More than £600 million of that could come from an increase in taxes. He also announced plans to create a new homes bonus to encourage councils to build extra properties. But the critics say the plans just don't go far enough in solving the current care crisis. Parents in England will be warned about sepsis from today as the NHS launches a national campaign. Backed by the Health Secretary, leaflets will be delivered to surgeries and hospitals and will appear in packs given to all pregnant women, warning them of the signs of the deadly illness which kills thousands every year, including 1,000 young children. Now, the campaign is the result of tireless campaigning by Melissa Mead, whose own baby son William died from sepsis two years ago. We'll be hearing more about the campaign in just a moment. But first, my friend Kylie Pentelow spoke to Melissa about William, about life with his baby brother and about why she has fought so hard to raise awareness. William was the most, um, the, the happiest little boy. He was just so content, he was so calm and he was so caring. Um, everything he did was really quite measured um, and, and he just there was like a bond between us um, and I just, every time I looked at him and he looked at me, it was just there, it was just right, he was, he was just perfect. Tell me about Arthur. Well, he's a cheeky little chap. <laughs> um, he's, he's just perfect. Um, we were really, really unsure when we actually found out we were having a boy because we thought he'd resemble William quite strongly and he does, but actually it's really comforting to know that they share something that nothing, that no one can take away, that they're brothers and he's just, he's, he's given us a future. He's cute, isn't he? Having some hope back lightens our life. It was in December of 2014 that William died. The, the time of year that William died is always going to be very difficult um, because what we do is we ruminate and it's this time two years ago I was doing this, this time two years ago we took him to the doctor, this time two, you know, and you almost, you can't change it and you want to change it and that hurts so much because you remember all of the finer details and, and you relive them. Most people who this happened to would have shut the door and tried to shut out the world and not done anything you took a very different approach. Why have you done so much? Why have you done so much campaigning? Well, for the first six or seven months, believe me, I shut the door. Um, and then actually it was about making sure that 
I still wanted to be William's mum and I couldn't be. And so I had to find a way to, to, to make that love tangible. I don't want anyone else to, to endure what we are. Um, I think it would be foolish to say that we can eradicate sepsis, but certainly we want to make sure that the preventable deaths don't happen. Everything that I do, I do because of love. I don't, there's no personal gain. We don't get anything from this, but what we do get to do is share our little boy. Like every other parent wants to talk about their little boy or their little girl, how they're growing up, how they're changing and developing. We don't get to do that, so we're doing it in the only way that we know how. And William, I'm, I'm sat here today doing this interview because of the little boy who died, but I'm the person that I am today because of the little boy who lived. And for that, I'll be forever grateful. Melissa is here with me in the studio, as is Dr. Ron Daniels from the Sepsis Trust. There were weepies during that. You have cause for great celebration, but the reason for the weepies is actually what it's all about. Absolutely. You know, I don't think any parent ever, ever imagines that they'll be sat here talking about the death of their child. And I, I think, you know, this is what this is. I'm sat here because of that. Um, but from that, you end up with an article written by the Secretary of State for Health in a national newspaper this morning, in effect saying game, set and match. Do you celebrate that? Are you magnanimous? I think it's always worth celebrating when he's on side. Um, I think that, like any other person, he's got young children. He doesn't want to be in our position. And I think no matter what job you're in, where you go, what you do through life, your children always come first. And... Is he always gracious to you? Always, yeah. He's, he's, he's a nice guy. Have you got what you want, Ron? I think it's fair to say we're on a journey toward getting what we want. We now have, and we're very proud to be associated with and partnering with the government in this awareness campaign to educate parents and empower parents as to what to do if they're worried about their little one. But of course, sepsis affects adults too, and I see this as the start of a journey. The other key thing about this is that there are brilliant men and women out there running our NHS 24-7. They're on a steep learning curve as well. They've now got the leaflets as well as mums and dads, but it's a steep curve for them. It is absolutely and I think what we want to get across to health professionals is this is a partnership. The, the crucial thing, particularly when faced with a worried parent, yeah. is to listen to that parent because that parent knows their child. Of course health professionals know about sepsis, of course they've received training on it, but the partnership demands that when a mum says, I'm worried, could this be sepsis, that the health professional listens, takes it seriously and thinks sepsis and sets out to exclude or confirm it. Can you now get Back to life with Paul and Arthur and the bear. I think um, our life has been changed and we're on a completely different path to a one that we have chosen. I think that my passion lies with campaigning with the Sepsis Trust. You know, I, I'm, I'm a parent to William forever and so this is a lifelong commitment. Melissa, congratulations thank and you. thank you for coming in. Ron, always a pleasure to see you from the Sepsis Trust. Thank you both very much indeed. And for information on how to spot the signs and symptoms, as Melissa and Ron were just saying, of sepsis, it's all there on our website, itv.com forward slash news. Still to come, honoured for bravery, the quick thinking of this Royal Air Force Sergeant mid-air and how he helped save the lives of two colleagues. But first, Britain's fertility regulator has decided to allow clinics to apply for permission to provide so-called three-parent baby treatment, which could help prevent babies being born with deadly genetic diseases. Board members of the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority gave the go-ahead for clinics to apply to carry out the technique, which essentially removes the faulty DNA from a mother's egg and replaces it with a third person's healthy DNA. Nick Wallace explains. One father, two mothers. A concept which just a few years ago would have been the stuff of fantasy is now a medical reality. Creating a baby by combining one woman's genetic information with another's mitochondria, a different sort of DNA, has been approved. It's a very significant decision. It's a historic one because this is the first time that mitochondrial donation has been allowed um, in clinical treatment for patients who have a serious life-threatening mitochondrial disease in their family. 
The procedure involves taking the mother's egg, which has faulty mitochondrial DNA, out of her body and removing the nucleus at its centre, which contains healthy genetic information. A separate egg from a woman with healthy mitochondria then has its nucleus removed and replaced with the mother's. The egg is fertilised with the father's sperm and implanted into the mother. Donors of healthy mitochondria are now being sought. It could help women like Sharon Bernardi, who lost all seven of her children to mitochondrial diseases. There are more and more couples out there. We, I've met them and, and they're so desperate to have a family. And I can only say a lot of couples would want to do that. Doctors at Newcastle University have been working for years on this advanced form of IBF, developing the concept and then proving it works. They say they already have 25 women on their books ready to take advantage of today's decision and conceive a healthy baby. It's great to see all the research come to fruition. It's a fantastic day for the families who, who will benefit from this treatment. And I think it's a great triumph of the regulatory system here in the UK. Clinics aiming to carry out this treatment must be licensed and every patient must be individually approved. But it's expected the first fertilisation will go ahead this spring, leading to the first baby with three parents being born in the UK before the end of next year. Nick Wallace, ITV News. Europe's biggest hospital has been ordered to improve security on its maternity wards after inspectors found that mothers were at risk of leaving the unit with the wrong baby. The Care Quality Commission said that some babies born at the Royal London Hospital in East London weren't given name tags, meaning they could receive the wrong medication or be given to the wrong mother. And Yahoo said that more than a billion of its customers might have had personal data, including phone numbers, passwords and email addresses, stolen in its biggest ever cyber attack. It happened in August 2013. British servicemen and women were honoured last night at the Sun's Military Awards. Celebrities and politicians attended the glittering ceremony in central London to pay tribute to the bravery of the armed forces. One of the winners was Sergeant Adam Threlfall, who was given an award after he gave first aid to two parachutists who collided mid-air. Sergeant Threlfall also on the, was on the jump and was able to see what happened and rush to the aid of the injured on the ground. Before we meet the hero himself, the men whose lives he helped save and what happened that day. My, my head actually makes contact with someone's knee, which unfortunately don't want to happen at, uh, at, that, at that height. Um, I've read the report, it's about 55 mile an hour, I think we collided at. The Threllers was there, first one on the ground, knew what had happened. Those, and I think those initial phases are, um, are crucial and that's, that's, it's all down to him really. When he landed, he took his helmet off and carried on filming the rest of the incident, as well as filming the actual, the accident itself and then carried on filming after. It was, it was great for obviously the investigation team. Well, quite simply without him. I don't think I'll be here. And Sergeant Adam Threlfall was listening to all of that and muttering to me as you were listening to it. Rob, the first one we heard for, is paralysed all one down one side. And, and Stubbsy, as you said, is, is back on exercises already. Yeah, Brooke, um, Brooke was injured in the incident as well. And he was um, uh, straight back to work as, as soon as his injuries um, allowed him to. And um, he's now back on exercise and looking to jump again in January. You're top of your trade. You train people how to parachute and save their lives in such circumstances. How did you also know what to do on the ground? You became a first aider, a life-saving first aider. Yeah, um, we're not... We do have injuries happen um, occasionally from time to time. And so we have um, situations where we do extra me um, medical training. Um, and as part of the general RAF as well, you have extra medical training. So I just literally tried to stabilise the the patients as I saw them um, and wait for the Air Force team to kick in. And you were head cam? Yeah. Cam, is that because it was a training exercise? Yeah, training exercise. We uh, tried to film, to review, to improve and um, I put it on uh, as soon as I saw something happening and then that helped with the investigation afterwards. So was gonna, yeah, so you end up, instead of having a bit of film that helps people know, pull it that way better rather than that, you've actually got case studies of how to save lives. Yes, and then from there we've then improved our training systems so that as we deliver further on, um, hopefully an incident like this will never happen again. Yeah. We were joking upstairs that you said, oh, it's just a team thing. But in reality, that is at the very heart of everything that you do. Absolutely everything. Um, after the incident, you know, the team really kicked in. The, the, the guys back at Bryce Norton flew um, C-17s out to, to bring Rob uh, back. 
threw his family out. Uh, the whole medical system has been incredible through uh, Birmingham all the way to Headley Court, where Rob is now. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, just looked amazing. Sergeant Warmest, congratulations to you and thanks for finding time for us today. Thank well you very much. Cheers. And you can watch the Sun Military Awards on Forces TV this Saturday and Sunday at 6 pm. And finally, for two years, twins Ava and Erica Sandoval were joined quite literally at the hip. The pair shared a bladder, liver, and parts of their digestive systems. Now they have been successfully separated after a 17 hour operation in California. Suzanne Verdi now on the moment they were reunited as two. Side by side, once again, after 17 hours of intricate surgery to separate them, once conjoined twins, Erica and Ava, are reunited, much to the delight and relief of their mum and dad. But it's a toy car, rather than her sister, that Erica seems more pleased to see. Yeah. Yeah. Tickle Erica. Tickle Erica. Tickle, tickle, tickle. For two years, the girls have shared everything, including a liver, pelvis, leg and digestive tract. Sending them for surgery was a difficult decision for their parents. The first time I saw the girls, um, it was very surreal. It still seems very surreal when I see one on one side and the other one on the other side. Um, but it brings us all joy. Their survival is down to their incredible strength and the skill of 50 doctors and nurses. I wanted each girl to have half of the belly button so that for the rest of their life they can look at that belly, that half a belly button and think that's where I was connected to my sister. They're separated now and preparing to lead independent lives, but they'll always be connected by an extraordinary bond. Suzanne Verdi, ITV News. And that is it. I'm back at 6.30 with Ranveer Singh. Until then, a very good afternoon to you. Bye-bye.